What happened to the church after the book of Acts? That's what we're going to talk about today. Accordingly, after one of these had been struck off, Jesus commanded the eleven on his departure to the Father, Go and teach all nations who were baptized into the Father, into the Son, and into the Holy Spirit. Immediately, therefore, so did the apostles. Tertullian, 210 A.D. What happens after the church? You know, we just got in the Bible in small steps, covering the book of Acts and then Romans. And it made me start to wonder, what happened? You know, how did the church spread on from here? And, you know, obviously we see that Paul went up to Tarsus and then traveled in the area of Turkey, modern day Turkey, Greece, Rome. He had desires to go to Spain. We don't have evidence that he went to Spain. But according to church tradition, he made it all the way to England. You know, we don't know exactly if that's true or not, but that's what a lot of people feel. When I was in India, I was in the southern tip area of India, and someone pointed out this church to me when I told him I was a Christian, and he said, this church right here was founded by St. Thomas. He came all the way here to India and founded all these churches here. We don't know again, but there are a lot of churches in India that say just that. There was also rumor that Thaddeus, Thomas, Simeon to Parthia, and John and Philip went to Asia Minor. That Again, that's going to be Turkey. And Peter ended up in Rome by being put to death there. When Christianity became the official religion of Armenia, it was still illegal in Rome to be a Christian. But there were writings, drawings, and they say that they were brought to faith by the apostle Bartholomew and Thaddeus. So a lot of this has to do with church tradition. There was a couple of books I used. The first one I can't really recommend. This guy um, used to be a Christian for a while, um, Bart Ehrman, and he lost his faith. He now is sort of a critic or a historian of the church without believing in it. But he was talking about how in his book, The Triumph of Christianity, How a Forbidden Religion Sucked the World, And the second book I read for this was Church History in Plain English, fourth edition by Bruce Shelley, who talks a lot about how the church spread. He is coming at from a Christian point of view, like I said, but Bart Ehrman was coming at from a non-Christian critical point of view or, I guess, secular point of view. And just to give you a little bit of a background of how Christianity spread right off the get-go, 29 BC to 14 CE, we had Augustus Caesar. You know, obviously, right, 30, around 30, we had the crucifixion of Jesus, the conversion of Paul around 33, the first letters of Paul in 50 AD, and then the fire in Rome where Emperor Nero blamed the Christians, put to death Peter and Paul. In 112 AD, Pliny writes about Christian persecution and saying, oh, gosh, there's so many of them. They're so hard to persecute. And this is a letter to Trajan. That's when we start seeing all the different famous martyrdoms. Justin Martyr wrote somewhere around 150 to 160 AD. Tertullian, who was big church leader, wrote from 195 to 225 AD. Origen, another huge church father, wrote from 215 to 254. Then we had persecution under the emperor Decius. We had persecution under Valerian. We had persecution under Diocletian, and then the Great Persecution, which happened around 300 to 300 AD. Eventually, at some point, Constantine, somewhere around 312 AD, becomes a Christian. And in 313 AD, the Edict of Milan happens, which means that Christianity would be tolerated and it it would become one of the official religions of Rome. These early church fathers, Eusebius in 324, Gregory of Nyssa, 380 AD, and then St. Augustine in 422. So you can see that this is spreading out. But the question is, is how did all of this happen? How did this come about so that the word of the church spread? According to this book written uh, by Ehrman, he says that, you know, around 30 AD, there's about 20 Christians. I say there's probably a few more than that because we had people who witnessed the death of Jesus. We had people who saw Jesus at Jesus' birth. What happened to all of them? But around 60 AD, there's about a thousand Christians and the apostles probably still alive. Around 100 AD, 7,000 to 10,000, this would have been probably shortly after about 10 years, the death of John, who was the last apostle to 
Liv, who died after being held on Patmos, which is an island, let to die in Ephesus, quiet peace. But suddenly, 150 AD, 30 to 40,000 Christians. 200 AD, 140 to 170 Christians. By the time we get 300 AD, where the big per- persecution was happening, two and a half million to three and a half million. And by the time we get to 400, where Rome is already converted to Christianity, 25 to 35 million. This is a church against all odds that grew and prospered in the world, you know, spread from 20 or so backwater fishermen who came from an area that people said nothing good comes from to becoming this religion that spread throughout the entire world. So the first question asks is, how did it get here? How did it spread? And first of all, Christianity is a missionary faith. We were told by God to go out and tell people not to stand on their necks, not to threaten them with a sword, but instead tell people. Witness, witness, think of as a court. I'm going to tell you what I know. I'm going to tell you what I saw. And so people started going around as missionaries, even if they had other occupations, like Paul was a leather worker, something like that. They had occupations and they spread throughout. But not only that, when we had various instances of persecution in the Roman area where the church was persecuted, even if they weren't being officially killed all the time, at some point they were not able to get jobs, they weren't able to do certain actions within the you know, government or other types of things because, well, you're not going to worship our gods. We're not going to let you do anything. And then it went into full-blown persecution. It reminds me, and this is a bad analogy, that I found some ragweed growing in my yard and I decided I had to cut it down because I am really allergic to ragweed. I cut it down and I accidentally dropped one of the stems. And as soon as I did, I saw this cloud of going everywhere. Every time when the church would get persecuted all the way back from like 70 where Rome was sacked and the Romans hauled everyone away that they didn't kill and people fled into the countryside. Every time it's like the, you know, you strike it and a cloud of seeds go out in every direction. When Nero said, you know, Jewish people had to leave, it spread Jewish people throughout the entire world. And some of them probably were Christians because it wasn't quite so clear cut, you know, at the time. A lot of people believe that the Christian faith was the fulfillment of Judaism. Some people didn't, but some people did. And initially, the entire church spread around the Mediterranean Sea. So you will see, obviously, the Israel, the areas now that would be considered Lebanon and Syria, big Christian areas, Turkey, the Church of Antioch, when Jerusalem was struck, became the headquarters practically, of the Christian faith because Jerusalem was in turmoil and under attack. Then it spread, you know, farther into Greece, into Rome, up through the Germanic tribes, and eventually Frankish areas, which would be France, Gaul, and these are what were considered to be barbaric or barbaric to the Romes areas. And so some of the very first barbarian tribes ended up becoming Christian. It also spread through the north of Africa, Alexandria, big church influence at the very beginning of the church and all the way around the Mediterranean in North Africa. This is where the church initially spread. And Carthage was another big place where it was dominated. Tunisia, Algeria had bishops and had a very full Christian life with churches, with text, with documentation, with cultural practices hymnal practices, all those types of things. So you can see that right through that Mediterranean area, and then even Roman Ireland, the church spread very early. And even the church in Alexandria said it was John Mark that founded their church. Again, we don't know for sure, but those traditions were written down closely to the time. Obviously, there's a little bit of prestige, you know, being founded by an apostle. So certainly people would want to claim that an apostle found their church We don't know, but I mean, it's not impossible either. When you see Paul and all his travel, pretty amazing, right? We start even seeing schools developing so that people can read the scripture, so people can recite prayers. The first beginnings of education and reading came from a lot of these trying to teach people so they can read scriptures. And at the beginning, there was a fellow named Celsus, which sounds like Celsius. He was part of what was considered to be the apologist movement. 
not an apology, but as a defense. I'm a lawyer and I'm going to defend what is being said about me. Because early on, these Roman emperors before Constantine accused Christians of all sorts of things. Murdering babies, sex with prostitutes, causing fires. And it turned out that Nero himself was probably causing the fires because he wanted to build a brand new Rome. Can't build a brand new Rome with all this stuff here, so I'm going to burn it down. And I'm going to blame someone I don't like anyway, the Christians, for all of this happening. The rumors going out about what the early Christians were doing caused people to be apologists. And I think we see that today, right? When people are persecuted, it hones their faith. They learn how to fight back against the culture. They learn how to talk about it. You see people who live unchallenged lives with their own ideas. And the early reaction to that in Rome was, we're going to put Christians in the gladiator arenas with, with animals for the most part. It's fun to watch gladiators fight each other, but just to see them strike down some poor dude in a, in a toga, that's not very much fun. So we'll get tigers and jaguars and all sorts of big cats, scary monsters, and put them in with these Christian leaders, these people, because again, Rome thought of punishment, just like the crucifixion, as a way of deterring whatever it is they wanted to deter. Look how public this is. You see Jesus hanging on the cross, don't be like him. That's the big idea. And they hated Christianity, not because they cared, I think, I mean, obviously, I think they cared about their gods. They were this mishmash of religions that allowed you to bring your God in, as long as you worshiped our gods too. And so you had a God for everything I was watching. And it's probably a fake show, but it probably really represented how Rome and Greece acted with their pantheon of gods. This guy's shoes kept wearing out. And he said, you know, do you pray to this God? He's the God of protecting shoes. And, oh, you know, that's a good idea. I should do that. So people shared minor gods here and there, but it wasn't like they were giving up on the main faith. And at some point that came, you know, really with Julius Caesar, which was before Christianity and Augustine and all that. Roman leaders became gods. We're, we are gods. You should worship our children, our gods. Now, some of the Roman emperors didn't believe that either, but you can't go away from the faith. And primarily because we can't have you disobeying us. If we tell you to bow down to our gods, you will bow down. And if you don't, we're going to make a very public death of you so that everyone can see this is what happens if you go against us. So this was a very brutal regime that probably would have let Christians pass had they just said, yeah, sure, Jesus is just one of many of the gods, that's fine. And they probably could have lived and the emperor probably wouldn't have cared so much. But because Jesus is the only way, the truth and the light, suddenly they're put to the sword and they're put down, they're put to the gladiator chambers and everything else like that. But it also means, again, that he got good so that he could go there. There was a fellow who was put right in the arena with all these animals and he just stood there boldly, probably scared to death, but knew that he would be martyred just like Jesus was martyred. And he was okay to fall in this kind of death, just like his Lord did too. We start seeing signs of Christianity taking root somewhere in the mid-240s. We start seeing Christian burial grounds. We see catacombs. So catacombs were a place where we could hide, but it's also a place that we could bury people in our Christian faith and not be worried that someone's going to find us out. But what happened soon after when Constantine was converted to Christianity, we start having to deal with heresies, I guess, is the best way to put it. And then because there was heresies, suddenly people start forming orthodoxy. No, we're following the right way. You are following the wrong way. It doesn't mean you're a bad person, but you're just you're doing the wrong thing. We've got to stop teaching it. And so then there were various councils that were put in place. The Council of Nicaea was there to determine Jesus was fully divine. He wasn't just a man. He wasn't just an image of a God or a prophet of a God. He was actually fully human. And so we keep ruling on these things because they keep having various rejections of it. So we had the Marcion rebellion or heresy that said the Old Testament is about Jewish people. It has nothing to do with Jesus. We are people of the New Testament. We are people of the Gospels. And they kicked him out of the church, too, because he was rejecting the Trinity. And even though the Trinity was never a word that was used in the Old Testament, 
We have seen many places where God talks about, I'm in him, he is in me, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It was talked about in this way. So there was a term, the Trinity, that was created to describe this idea of Jesus, God, the Father, and the Holy Spirit being together. Then that was rejected. And so, no, 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 there's no Trinity. There's only God the Father. Oh, no, no, there's not God the Father because he was Jewish. There's only Jesus. Well, there's not really a Holy Spirit. That is just a sense of faith, you know. And so all these things started happening where people started getting their own ideas of what faith was and what faith wasn't. Probably one of the very first heresies was Gnosticism. And the Gnosticism believed that there was the Spirit that is good. The Spirit is the Spirit of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. The, the thing inside that us that wants to be good, but the flesh is evil. And we've seen parts in the book of Romans where it sort of hints that the spirit you know, is willing, but the flesh is weak. They take it so far to say everything physical, and that's going to be eating and drinking and sex and all these things, that anything that has to do with the physical body, bad. And this is Gnosticism, and it was a big part. It, we, I think, see writings towards it happening all the way in the earliest parts of the gospel. But then Polycarp, who was a student of John, so he knew John directly, understood that this was not the way that God intended it. It, it, Despite what the Bible hints at, it's not saying everything physical is bad. They also believe then that Jesus didn't die because death is a physical thing. It was like a stand-in, that if we are resurrected, It's not in the body because the body is bad and sinful. So the material world, everything in it is is just bad, lower, not divine like the spirit is divine. And so then there was another type of heresy that was going on. And so, like I said, we have all these consuls that started forming in the early church. The Council of Nicaea was around 325. The Son is begotten, created physical being. The Son is eternal from the beginning of time. Father is eternal. You've done the Nicene Creed, which we do in a lot of our churches. Then the council in Constantinople in 381 said that Jesus was fully human. He wasn't just a a soul or a spirit. He was physically here, the divine logos made flesh. The council in Ephesus in 431 There is a union of divine and human in Jesus. Chalcedon Council in 451 said that these all are divine, they're distinct, and yet they coexist, the divine and the human nature. So you see, they're sitting there and trying to sort of wrestle things out as they go, as various heresies start to go. But in reactions to these heresies, people seem to feel that we have to have an orthodoxy. We have to get this written down. We have to come up with rules. We have to come up with rules of the faith. Sometimes rules are good, so we are able to define what's right and what's wrong and what's biblical. But then it also means that we're going to say certain people are outside the faith. We still have many differences in what we see as faith. Like I said, some of them are whether or not James was actually the brother of Jesus, whether Mary ever had children, period. That is a different place of orthodoxy and heresy. Or whether baptism should be immersed, or it can be sprinkling. Should it be children, or should it be adults? Did God predestine us so that some people are set to be saved and other people were set to be damned? These are all places we have, even throughout the Reformation. Are you saved by faith, or are you saved by your good work? We could go on, you know, probably a bunch of these types of things. But at this point, when these churches started having these consuls, in reactions to the heresies that were leaking into the church, at that point, rules had to be set down. And sometimes I think the rules were correct, and sometimes I think the rules were wrong, and sometimes the reaction to people who did not follow the rules led to horrible situations, wars and deaths and persecutions of other types of Christian people. And so we're not going to go into a further uh, piecing of it, because then you could eventually get to how the Roman church with Constantinople, spread between East and West, each of the church half being given to two sons, Rome and everything to the West of it, and Greece and everything to the East of it, and how they split up. The Byzantine church, you know, versus the Roman church. The Mediterranean was primarily where the church spread, but it also went as far as 
Armenia, Assyria. These were early important churches, Mesopotamia area, and Persia, which would be Iraq today. Early church places where the message spread. And they said that it probably spread through the Aramaic language, which was very well known very early on, and Greek. But when Christianity even reached Bulgaria, there was a fellow named Boris. He was the king, but he also converted in the 9th century AD the Vladimir, the Grand Prince of Kiev and all of Russia. So now Christianity comes to Russia, which then eventually we got the Russian Orthodox Church as compared to the Greek Orthodox Church. And if you didn't know, the emperor took his title of czar. It's the same word in Russian as Caesar. He went to Rome, learned about Christian faith, and then decided he was going to become a Roman Caesar. Very weird. Even talks about how the Anglo-Saxons, as well as the Franks, the Gauls, you had the Angles and the Saxons turn to Christianity. You had many of those Germanic tribes, the Lombards, the Goths, the Vandals. There's a really fantastic history channel show about all the barbarian tribes, but they became Christians. And in fact, Some of the Vikings then were early Christians. They fought Christianity with their own faith, but some of them became early Christians too. And when many of the various Goth tribes, which was another barbarian tribe, some became Christians, when they were persecuted, they fled. And where did they go? To Bulgaria. But that, again, it's like the ragweed, right? You hit it and it spreads even further. One of the very first barbarian was a king called Clovis. He would have been in the area of France. A lot of these barbaric tribes that were sacking and attacking Rome before he became a Christian, somewhere around 481. Why did the church first go west and then go east? Rome built marvelous roads. Rome built the infrastructure that allowed the spread of Christianity. It's such an interesting thing to take something where someone created this tool that was first used to march Roman soldiers into your area and slaughter you, now allowed you to spread the faith of Christianity through shipping, through Roman roads, through the fantastic Roman network that they had. Then from that point on, it goes and spreads, you know, around the 8th century where Boniface went into the Roman area, was the sacred forest of Thor, and took an axe to it. Just to give you some stories about how faith moved through these areas, that it changed from going through poor people, people who are subjugated by the Roman Empire, to being a little bit different once we have the Roman Empire, to even being a lot more different when the Roman Empire split into two, the Eastern and the Western Church. Very interesting stuff. The church history in plain language is a great read about how the early Christian church started. So my challenge to you is think about how faith spreads. It spreads through charity, charitable hospitals, charitable organizations. It spreads through people, missionaries, and just normal schmoes like us telling other people about it. And it spreads because we have these open house churches where you can show up anytime and talk to a pastor. But think about the spread of Christianity and how people go into different directions. Obviously, in the history, we have had some bad directions. We have had terrible things happen in the name of Christianity. But at the very beginning, and I think right now, it spreads word of mouth, martyrdom, kindness, charitable giving, charitableness to our neighbors. That's how it is supposed to be spread. Jesus said he, that we would be known by the love we have for each other. And I think the love we have for the rest of the world. I already want to thank so much for listening. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this quick look at it. I mean, you could sit there and talk about church history forever and ever. But it's an interesting thing to see how what airmen calls 20 people, I would say it's probably a lot more than that, spread, though, within a very short 400 years to being 35 million. It's it's really amazing, and it's a blessing of God for sure. Have a wonderful week. Please remember that you can always email me at jill at startwithsmallsteps.com. I would love to hear from you. And remember... Our walk through the history of the church starts with small, small steps and then eventually big, big leaps. 